Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On this episode, we're joined by Luella Brin. Luella is the editor-in-chief at Four Points Press, an independent media company which covers the Crow Indian Reservation in southern Montana. She is Absaloka. Luella also teaches high school journalism and has taught college in the past, too. She was the primary narrator in the new Showtime docuseries Murder in Bighorn. Hi, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. I want to talk about the docuseries, but I want to talk about you as well. And I want to start with your journalism origin story. Can you tell me about it? I started writing for the high school paper at Hardin High School in the 90s. I got into a car accident and they wanted me to write about my experience in the car accident. So I wrote a little kind of first person narrative about the car accident and the minute I saw my byline, I was hooked. So the next year I took journalism class and then my senior year I took journalism class and then I edited for the student paper and still planned on going into teaching, but I ended up winning an essay contest at the University of Montana where I wrote an essay for myself and my best friend as part of a student trip that we took. And after I graduated, I was working at the local county paper at, as the front desk receptionist. And a man named Dennis McAuliffe came to award me my prize for winning this essay contest. And he just so happened to be the native journalist in residence at the University of Montana Journalism School. And uh, essentially it was a recruiting trip. He said that because, you know, he was the the lead judge on this essay contest, he thought I would make a good writer, but because of the, the content and stuff, he thought it would be a good fit for journalism school. And they they said they had a hard time writing or judging first and second place. And I said, well, that's really interesting because I wrote the second place essay for my friend because she didn't want to write it, but she wanted to go on the trip. So he ended up giving me the prize for first place and second place. Can you explain to us where you grew up? I grew up on the Crow Indian Reservation and in like South Central, Southern, Eastern, Southeastern Montana. It's a really small community, rural. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody's related to everybody. We're all up in each other's business. We're mostly, it's just, it's just, you know, kind of small town America. We just happen to be Native American. No, I was just going to say, was there anything in your upbringing or heritage that lent itself to telling stories? Oh, definitely. I mean, our whole culture is based on the, you know, the oral tradition of storytelling. And I grew up believing that really journalism is kind of the natural evolution of Native storytelling. Because especially in in the, the Crow way, if you're going to earn honors as a warrior, your story has to be truthful and there has to be witnesses to your story. Which is like journalism. Your story has to be truthful. There has to be witnesses. There has to be attribution. There has to be other voices in in that story. So, like I was saying, the the natural evolution of, of what we did as Crow people when we told stories really lends itself well to, to journalism because there has to be, there's accountability in, in the storytelling. And there's there's witnesses in the storytelling. There's there's loyalty to truth in the storytelling. And there's a through through line essentially that I guess takes us from your earliest days, and then through the University of Montana, and then you had a, a fair number of jobs after you got out of school. And I'm curious which ones shaped you the most in terms of who you are. Gosh, I don't. I've had several several different lives. As a student, I had several internships at newspapers, and those really solidified my desire to be a journalist. 
And then once I became a professional, I lost my job fairly quickly to the economy. After about two, two and a half years in the business, I got laid off and ended up working as a media consultant for the Crow tribe and taught legislators, tribal legislators, how to communicate with the media, taught them how to write press releases, taught them media awareness, gave them contact lists of who to contact when certain, they had certain news stories that they wanted to promote and thought maybe that, that kind of work was, you know, productive. And so thought about finishing my master's degree in public relations. And so when I went back to school to finish that degree, it just didn't seem like the right fit. With the work that I did as an intern for the tribe and the the program that I was in, it just, they didn't feel like the same type of work. So I ended up taking a job at Little Bighorn College, which is our tribal college, and I taught writing classes. So I was actually there for five years teaching writing and public speaking, human relations, and a lot of developmental classes. So developmental reading, developmental writing, and had a really great time, but teaching five classes a semester is rough. (laughs) so and I had about half the student body in my courses because all my courses were required classes so I had anywhere from you know 80 to 125 students every semester and that got pretty pretty difficult pretty quickly so after about five years I decided to move on to a different position and I worked as a outreach coordinator for St. LeBray Indian School So I wasn't in the school, I was in the Youth and Family Services Department where I got to work with the community, where I taught job skills to people. I ran the food bank. I did community activities like community cleanups and I did the bike safety rodeo. And so all of these careers offered me new and amazing experiences with the community, with the Crow community and the Northern Cheyenne community. And got to meet so many people and I think the the biggest benefit of having these different careers was the people because now in my work as a journalist I have this huge network of people that I can choose from if I need to write a story I'm I I've never had a loss for people I I always have the right person that I can go to because of my work in the community and it's never a a surface level relationship it's always through some other work that I've done something substantial that I've done that I know people and I can call on them and say hey I'm working on a story about this do you want to comment or do you know anyone who can comment on it and because we've built an actual relationship, they're more likely to help me or to comment on a story than if it was just a surface rubble relationship. And that takes us to now and Four Points Press. On your website, it says the mission is that this company will also will provide important educational news stories about Indian country that inform and entertain, as well as literary and audio video works that lift Native voices and reflect the indigenous experience in an authentic way. What more would you like to say about the mission of that of Four Points? It's going to take a few years to completely accomplish our mission, but it's, I mean, everything's already happening quicker than I thought it would. So I have no doubt that we're going to actually accomplish everything we want to accomplish in our mission. How did it start? I was incredibly frustrated with the position I was in at our local county paper 
there were, I, I, I got a lot of pushback from covering the reservations, Crow and Northern Cheyenne reservations. They wanted me to cover more of the county and 60, I maybe even more than 60% of the county is on the Crow or the Northern Cheyenne reservation. And they kept telling me, my bosses kept telling me, I'm covering too much reservation rules. You need to cover Hardin more. And nothing really happened and was happening in Hardin because there was COVID shutdowns and it's just, it's a small town and not a lot happens there. And the, the reservations are, you know, much larger communities that, you know, just more things happen because they're larger communities. And I really just got tired of putting in 60 hours a week for an organization that was basically telling me don't cover Indian, just cover the white people. When a large portion of our subscribers were Native, a large portion of our readership was Native, a large portion of our community is Native, and I think that a newspaper should reflect the community. We were, we weren't sacrificing the news of the town of Hardin by any means, and I just was done with it. There's a meme where the guy throws his papers up in the air, <laughs> and he's like, "I'm out of here." That was essentially me. I no. kind of threw my stuff in the air, and I was like, "I'm done." And that was a little more than a year ago, right? Yeah, that was about 15 months ago, November 20, or December. I, I can't even do math. October 2021. I made sure my team had everything in place for the edition for that week. And then by, I sent an email in that said, at the end of the day, I'm done. And that the team was set up for the rest of the week all the pages are ready to go I gave them the budget for what went on what pages and left with a happy heart I didn't feel that about it at all and that was on a Monday and by Saturday I bought my domain name and within two weeks I had published had built a website and published my first story on fourpointspress.com so some of the pieces on your website, this was as of a week ago, include a look at the history between the Crow and Lakota, a story about legislation connected to an Indigenous People's Day, a commentary about how the West is being exploited by house builders who just kind of want to be seen. I'm curious, how do story ideas on your site go from initial idea to finished product? We have our staff meeting every Monday and... My two reporters, whatever they want to write about, as long as it's connected to the Crow community, they I kind of give them free reign, as long as it's not absolutely ridiculous. So Nicholas, he likes to cover very like newsy, contemporary, what's going on, traditional stuff. So right now he's out covering a story about a family who had... The, the son was murdered and so now the family to memorialize him he happened to be a, a long haul trucker so the family to memorialize him they're serving a meal from 3 to 6 today to people at the truck stop the truckers at the truck stop so he's covering that today whereas Rusty he likes to do a lot of history stuff he likes he wants people to know the history of the community so he proposed the idea of visit of the crow the sioux when they came to crow country so that's gonna be that's a four-part series i'm working on part three today and then he has two out two bar ideas for series historical series and so every once in a while i have to raid him in and be like okay you could do another series but you got to do 
something contemporary now too. <laughs> so what's a day in the life like for you? Well, I teach journalism and media at Lodgecrest High School. So I go to Lodgecrest, try to get there on time. Getting places on time is really difficult for me. So try to get there on time, teach my four classes. I have yearbook class. I have audio visual production class, journalism class, a photojournalism class. Then I drive, I think it's 20 miles back into Crow Agency. And so that like on Mondays, you would have our staff meeting at one. And so I drive back to Crow Agency. We have our staff meeting. We talk about all the stories that they want to do for the week. And then I put them in a prior, give them the priority order. And this is what you need to work on first, second, third. And this is what you can hold for next week. And since we don't have, I Rusty and Nicholas both worked with me at the Bighorn County News. And so they're used to having a weekly deadline. So I have to constantly remind them we're not weekly. I need something every few days. So I would when I give them their, the order of what I need, I'm like, okay, this one I need tomorrow this one I need on Friday this is what I need on next Monday and uh, we do have office an office we're looking for a new office space though because our office is so tiny we can all barely fit in it <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's just growing pain that's nice it's good to have growing pain absolutely but it's it's interesting because I've never, I've never, I was I was the boss at the county paper, but I had bosses ahead of me, so really I was like middle management. But here, Four Points Media, Four Points Press dot com, I'm I'm the boss. I have my board because we're a nonprofit, but they don't really get involved with press like content. They're mostly policy and procedure. Sometimes I'm like, who do I turn to <laughs> if I have a question about, is this a good story? Like, I really have to trust my news judgment. And if I don't trust my news judgment, I have to call on someone. I have friends in the industry, our friends in tribal news. I'll I'll call on them and be like, okay, here's that. Here's, here's an idea. It's just a good story because I have no idea. Most of the time, they are good stories. I just, I'm second guessing myself to say, this is something that I've never done before. I've never gotten to do before. So it's, it's wonderful, but it's scary and new. For sure. We had one journalist interviewed recently who described herself as, quote, a misfit. On your Twitter, you describe yourself as indigenous badass. And I'm curious, what does what does that mean in terms of how you approach journalism? Uh, <laughs> yeah, indigenous badass. It just means it just it's just the how I feel. You know, a lot of times as Native people, we're overlooked or we're not. We're seen as static black and white images in museums or in history books, and. That's that's just kind of my way of saying, you know, I'm here, I'm I'm alive, and I'm I do great things, and I think that in the grand scheme of native journalism, there's not a lot of independent native journalism. There's a lot of tribally owned news. Which, you know, is a great place to start. Tribally owned news is a great place to start because it's better than not having anything at all. But for me, I wanted to produce independent of anything. I wanted an organization that stood on its own. So we're not controlled by the tribe and we're not controlled by we're 
really anything. Well, we would, we're not going to be controlled by advertisers as well. Once we get our advertisers in and kind of our, our rally call is free press, free people. And we, as, as a tribal community, as a, as a tribal government, we have a bill of rights in our constitution that guarantees us free press. It's never been challenged though. So this is my way of saying, okay, you guys are giving us a free press. I'm going to challenge that. I'm going to, I'm going to start up a free press and I'm going to see how far I can push it. You talked about Native Americans being overlooked and that kind of segues right into the docuseries Murder and Bighorn that was on, that's on Showtime that can be a scene streaming or for time, I suppose, on demand, it takes both a micro and macro look at a frightening issue, which is teenage girls from native reservations in Montana going missing and dying. This is in Bighorn County. The documentary largely focuses on three, but there are dozens. The macro part of the story connects it to colonization. And there are so many things in what happens within the the story that just don't make sense bodies showing up in fields on federal land rather than native land which is an important distinction as it turns out they turn up in strange ways the autopsies always say hypothermia there are conflicts of interest in law enforcement one of the missing girl's father had been accused of sexual abuse and he's the under sheriff a lot of things quite frankly are ripe for a documentary and i'm curious what reporting you've done on these cases as you were featured prominently in it yeah, I, when I got my job at the county paper, the Henny Scott case has had been in the news and it was just now getting to the point of a um, determination of how she died. So we didn't do much reporting on her case, but I followed her case really closely. And with the, we followed and reported on the, the Kaysera South Pretty Places case and the Selena Notabry case very closely in the news in the county paper. And I'm still following all three cases. I wasn't in the I wasn't in the industry during the Shakaya Harding case. But as a community we fought we follow these cases anyway. Because they affect everything that we do. They affect how we parent our kids. They affect how we react. They 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 really do traumatize and re-traumatize us. And it's one of those things that is incredibly difficult to articulate. And I think that the documentary can serve as a way for it can serve as a way to help our community articulate the difficult emotions that came from that time period that people don't have the words for and it can help them by validating what they were feeling because a lot of times when we talk about these things, we're invalidated. Oh, like, you know, if, if you watch the documentary, you see a former undersheriff say that MMIP doesn't exist. That's the sentiment in a lot of the surrounding communities. But throughout the rest of the documentary, you see very real examples of this existing. And... Uh, for a national audience to see what we went through that validates our trauma it validates our grief and I think that once those feelings become valid I think that's when healing can start in our community how do you how did you get some of the people that you talked to and I suppose the people that talked to 
trip time the, to the production crew. How did you get them to open up and trust you? I think that, you know, credit to Showtime, they had a native co-director, native producers, and that's, you know, one of the first times I've ever seen that. A lot of times companies will have assistants that are native, but not producers and directors that are native. And to have someone involved like Like me, as as you know, the the on site journalist, who's a native, who's a local, that adds to a level of trust, and already knowing these families, and already they already had talked to me before, I think that that helped add to the trust. But yeah, having people. Literally having people who grew up on the reservation in positions of power, like as a director, as producers, that was huge that you don't see that. And so to have to have that on a on a showtime project, it it changed the game. What's next in terms of the coverage of the of those we have a grant from the International Women's Media Fund. They have a MMIW grant that we got. And then the Potlatch Fund gave us a grant for operating costs. So we're going to use those two $5,000 grants to cover murdered and missing Indigenous people. And the way we're going to present these cases it's going to be a little bit different than the way we see it in the news. Because the way we see MMIP stories in the news can be re-traumatizing because the story of the person who goes missing or is murdered and then the story of their case are all intermingled together. And that can be re-triggering because we don't have any control over what we're ingesting when we're reading those stories. So what we're going to do at Four Points Press is create really nice biographies that rehumanize the person who has been gone so long that they've become statistics. So talk to family members, talk to friends, and create biographies of these people. Run a nice photo with it. And then let that sit on the website for a week or two before we present a case study of their criminal investigation, either missing persons investigation. And then throughout the case study, they'll be presented in kind of shorter snippets or vignettes with some some headlines. That way, a person can read it if they become really triggered they can walk away from it. They'll have some agency in how they're consuming that. And when they come back to it, they have the subheadlines to guide them back to the area where they were reading. Sounds very people-centric, which is something that I wind up talking to people a lot about here, centering the, the people in the story rather than necessarily the, the tragedy that happened to them. I want to switch gears just slightly here. I, so, you know, I have three questions left. What are your journalism classes like? If I'm a student and I come to you with a question, whether it's basic or something more intense, what kind of help do you provide? Oh, my journal, journalism classes are very laid back. They're very, it's really difficult to teach high school higher because they're really intense and they're very emotional creatures. So oftentimes we're talking on tangents about other stuff. And the previous teacher, he was winging it the whole time. So I don't really have a curriculum. So since he winged it, I have to wing it. And I got a book that has uses a lot of like comic, comic strips in it to catch their attention and then it has really short, snappy language in it. So 
the lessons are incredibly short and quick hit. And then the the writing part is probably the most difficult part for me to teach because the attention spans, thanks to things like TikTok, are <laughs> so short. And I have ADHD, and my attention span is really short, but these kids have me beat. <laughs> <laughs> but I heard you use TikTok. Yeah, and I, I'm on TikTok too, so I'm just like zipping through. But these kids, their attention spans are so short. It, really difficult to keep their attention but will you use tiktok to teach we did i tried to i tried to get them to make a tiktok video introducing themselves and they were they were so scared to do it so <laughs> we're gonna work on that gotcha where would you like four points press to be a year from now a year from now i'd like us to have more funding we're working on looking for funders I'd like to expand our podcast network and I would like us to have more regular content on our website. Definitely have regular days of the week, like Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, where we have content every day rather than kind of here and there. So I'd just like us to be more regular, definitely and have more to offer on our podcast network. And hopefully by, by the end of next year, by the end of this year or early next year, we'll have our first edition of our MMIP project done. And we'll have 12 biographies and case studies done that we can present in a, in a book. Because what we want to do is get those 12 stories done, put them in a book and sell that book which could help fund the next year's project. Gotcha. And for now, you're you're supported by organizations like the Tiny News Collective? Yes, we have a Reynolds Journalism News Founder Grant for $100,000 and the Women's Media Foundation, Women's International Media Foundation Grant for 5000 Potlatch Foundation, and then we're part of the Tiny News Collective. The show is called The Journalism Salute. We salute your good work and ask that you do likewise. This episode is going to air right around the start of Women's History Month. Is there a female journalist in history that you would like to salute for what she's done? I would love to salute Hattie Kaufman. One of the journalists that really got me thinking about journalism as, career, as a career was Hattie Kaufman. She was the first Native American on broadcast news. And once I knew that, once I realized that, it was like I, I was, I could, I started to consider journalism as a career because there was another native out there who was doing it, who could do it, who didn't see any boundaries. And if she didn't see any boundaries, then I didn't have to see any boundaries. Sounds like a good note to end on and a good person to salute. Luella Bryn, thank you for taking the time to join us. Best of luck and keep us posted on how your news organization is doing. Thank you so much. You have a great week. Four Points Press is an independent media company which covers the Crow Indian Reservation in southern Montana. They are dedicated to giving the voice back to the people of the region and getting the story right. The mission of Four Points Media Incorporated is to work independently and in collaboration with the community to enrich the minds, spirits, and lives of those in Indian country by producing meaningful stories. For more information, go to their website, fourpointpress.com, F-O-U-R pointpress.com. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at JournalismPod, and you can email us at journalismsalute at gmail.com.